As the congressman from the 3rd Congressional District of Missouri, Representative Luke Amaya represents 13 counties. He's a native of St. Louis, of St. Elizabeth, Missouri, has lived in the district with his family for four generations, and he operates a 160-acre farm there. Along with a strong agricultural background, he was also a small businessman and a bank regulator in the state of Missouri. From 1999 to 2005, Representative Luke Kameyer was a Missouri State Representative and served as chairman of the Financial Services Committee and was also elected by his colleagues to serve as the House Republican Caucus Chairman. He, serves as a direct, he served as the director of the Missouri Division of Tourism. Representative Luke DeMeyer was first elected to Congress in November of 2008, and he has been reelected ever since. He serves as a member of the House Financial Services Committee and the subcommittee chairman of housing and insurance. In addition, Representative Luke DeMeyer serves as vice chairman of the House Small Business Committee. In the 113th Congress, he was ranked Missouri's most effective lawmaker. Representative Luke Kameyer is a member of the Knights of Columbus, Eldon Chamber of Commerce, Missouri Farm Bureau, National Rifle Association, and a lifelong member of the St. Louis of St. Lawrence Catholic Church. He is a graduate of Lincoln University in Jefferson City, Missouri, where he earned a degree with distinction in political science and a minor in business administration. Representative Luke Kameyer and his wife Jackie have three children and four grandchildren. Please help me welcome Congressman Luke Kameyer. Good morning. How's everybody doing this morning? Got that second cup of coffee down, do you? I see some smiles and some nodding heads. Must have needed a second cup of coffee this morning, huh? <laughs> well, that's okay. Very good. Uh, how many of y'all, uh, well, welcome, first, welcome to Washington, D.C. How many of you have been here before? Most of you? Oh, all of you. All right. You're returning, folks. Okay. Didn't scare you away from all this, huh? I noticed you've got your quilts up here um, and having lock channels. Is that right? That's a raffle? Okay. That's kind of neat. Um, my wife... Uh, my, my mother actually made a lot of quilts, so uh, at home we have quilt auctions all the time at our local, you know, uh, community events. So this is uh, kind of neat to see this up here in Washington, D.C. I didn't realize people did that anymore in this place. But uh, uh, my, uh, if you ever need some more, let me know. We got, our business buys one every year, so we, we, we've got lots of quilts we, <laughs> we donate. Uh, but anyway, thank you all of you for the invitation to be here this morning. It's great to uh, be with you. Um, <clears throat> Let me tell you first, let me start off by telling you how much I respect what each of you do for our rural communities. Thank you so much for all that you do. Uh, as you know, I was introduced and um, I live in a small town called St. Elizabeth where uh, I was born and raised and came back home after a trip off to school and off to, to do some work for a while. And that's where I raised my kids, a town of 300 people. So you don't get much more rural than that when you can stand on one end of the town and look and see the other end. Um, just don't blink as you go through. You'll miss all of it. And, uh, but it's a neat place to live and raise kids. And uh, uh, now we're raising, helping raise our grandkids. Uh, my wife takes, picks them up in the morning at, for school. So it's, uh, it's a neat place to be. Uh, despite Washington spending over $22 trillion to fight poverty, if you were born poor today, you're just as likely to remain poor as you were 50 years ago. Stable housing is a building block out of poverty. Speaker Ryan's task force rec recognizes this and their poverty report addresses it in three ways. Number one, first goal is to align HUD housing benefits with other benefits, including TANF. Second, we need to reduce duplication and overlap across programs. Third, we should strive for more individual choice in housing programs, creating opportunities and building better partnerships with nonprofits and other service providers. I mean, I work in my hometown in, or in, uh, in my hometown anymore, but I still live there, and I go home every weekend, and so it's that place that I keep in mind when I'm here in Washington to try and solve problems, trying to keep in perspective uh, what you do and how they affect the people where you live. It's been an honor to serve as chairman of the Housing and Insurance Subcommittee for the 114th Congress. My subcommittee has jurisdiction over HUD and the bulk of the nation's housing programs, including those under the Rural Housing Service. 
My background isn't in housing, but I've always had an appreciation for the incredible work of housing authorities in Missouri and across the nation. And it's been a learning experience for me from the standpoint of getting to know more and more people in the housing area, visiting different, sort, different across the spectrum uh, housing authorities from rural to inner city to <clears throat> suburban. Uh, it, it's, been a, it's been a great learning process for me as well. So, uh, but it's been a busy two years for the subcommittee as, we predict, as we've done uh, rigorous oversight of HUD programs and policies, advancing legislative initiatives to streamline rules and finding ways to help you deliver your services to more Americans in need. We've also played a role in Speaker, uh, in Speaker Ryan's Poverty Task Force, something on which Speaker Ryan has spent an incredible amount of time and energy. As a whole, House Representatives will continue to strive to foster opportunity and upward mobility for all Americans. Now, with regards to H.R. 3700, the Housing Opportunity Through Modernization Act of 2015, <clears throat> who hasn't heard of that? Anybody? Anybody? Okay. Uh, it's one of the accomplishments that I'm most proud of, uh, which we were able to get this thing across the finish line. It's a very unique piece of legislation from the standpoint that it's actually the first bill, I think 27 years that actually was, we were able to get through the House and the Senate with unanimous uh, votes in each body, as well as be a bill within which could be amended on the floor at any time. And we were able to fight off the amendments that would try and kill the bill, as well as strip things out that, or keep things from being stripped out of the bill that we thought were important. So uh, it's really a monumental piece of legislation from that standpoint, and it's not my legislation per se. It's a, it's a, it's a team effort. Anytime you do things like this, you have to understand that there are many, many people involved. Uh, I got Chris Brown with me this morning. I know where he went off to, but here, he's the guy that kind of stands on his shoulders. He's my staff person, and helps shepherd these things to, through, and it's a bipartisan piece of legislation, as you well know being unanimously uh, approved in both bodies. That means everybody from the farthest right to the farthest left thought they could live with what was in there. And so that's, that's quite an accomplishment. And we thank you for your participation because as we went through the process, we tried to get all the stakeholders involved and make sure that everybody understood what we're trying to do, uh, come in and tell us what the solutions were to the problems. And I always tell people, so don't bring us your problems. We'll our solutions will screw this thing up worse because we don't know what the unintended consequences are of our solutions. And so you bring us your solutions, these are things that you know will work and things that you've vetted or things that you know that the unintended consequences of those are you can, something you can live with. So, you know, my, I'm a business guy, I'm not a politician. I've come here to do some work and get things done. And the way I do things in my world is you sit down around a table and you hash it out and knock things together and you come up with a solution and you move on. And so that's what we try to do with this. Just get everybody around the table, knock it out, see what's what we could get done and accomplished. And we were able to do a lot. So. Um, it's, um, as you well know, it's comprised of a lot of non-controversial measures aimed at modernizing programs and processes of HUD and rural housing service, uh, signed into, into law by the president this past July, and uh, was quite frankly the biggest and most comprehensive piece of reform in federal housing policy in more than three decades. Uh, now the bill doesn't necessarily change the world, it didn't alleviate all the regulatory burdens facing public housing authorities, and it didn't eliminate the growing wait lists. But it represents a great first step in meaningful reform of our broken housing system. The new law contains a number of provisions that will help housing providers more efficiently deliver their services to a larger number of people in need. For example, streamline the dwelling unit pro inspection process, streamline income review requirements, made changes to the project-based voucher program to give PHAs more authority and flexibility. And it allowed PHAs flexibility to blend up to 20% of capital and operating funds, among other things. The new law would also streamline the loan approval process for RHS by authorizing the USDA to use direct endorsement lenders to approve RHS guaranteed single family loans. 3700 represents the beginning of what I hope will be a long conversation on housing reform. I think it shows how things can get done. I think it shows that uh, there are interests on all sides that can be met if you'd sit down and work together. Um, obviously, there's Still things to do, um, and one of the problems with it, obviously, is funding. It's gonna be a continued challenge. I think we have to learn how to do more with less or the same amount, and in doing that, I think in, 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 we have to streamline things so that we can give you the flexibility uh, to cut costs to be able to do what it takes to manage your facilities in a way that makes sense for yourselves, your people, and your communities. And so, uh, hopefully, you continue to work with us I always talk to folks and say, look, you know, bring, uh, come, come to us with your ideas. So there, there's other things we can do. I'm sure that once this bill is in, in place, uh, a couple of people already mentioned a couple of things to me that we can sort of tweak to make it better or they're not quite perfect. So 
Uh, there's no perfect piece of legislation, trust me. There is nothing that's perfect. So uh, we, we expect to have to go in and probably tweak a few things here and there. So don't hesitate to contact us, our office or our committee, to find out um, how we can help you and make this a better, a better situation, as well as come with more ideas with regards to uh, what else we can do in this next session. And so speaking of the next session, I know that um, there's going to be a change of leadership. Uh, president Obama was termed out. We've had elections, and now we have a new president-elect. And from there, um, we'll see how it all goes. I think there's going to be a different dynamic to the, to the place around here. Uh, and I think um, I know from the people who I talk to in my rural part of the, the world, they're pretty excited about this opportunity. Um, they were very upset with where the direction was of the country with regards to rules, regulations, this, this uh, over-regulation, this continual burden that's being placed on them and they want to change, and they voted for it. And uh, I think that uh, we're going to see a lot of change. I know that the, uh, the new president-elect is working with uh, our side of the aisle a lot. We've been working with him uh, for several months prior to the election, and we're continuing to work with him now. Uh, in fact, Chris uh, Brown, the guy I was talking about a minute ago, my, my uh, financial services guru here, he's on part of the transition team to help work with um, various financial services issues that uh, the administration wants to know about and wants to be able to network back with uh, all of us. Um, they're about solutions. They're not about partisan politics. They're not about making a statement. They're not about sticking a finger in your eye. They're about getting something done. And I think if you work with us, you'll find that there's going to be an opportunity for a lot of changes, positive changes, that I believe can be important to um, your industry as well as the rest of the country as, as a whole. Um, <clears throat> I think that at the end of the day, um, we're going to see some things that I think will be very impactful. And um, I think that we're, we're headed down the right path. Uh, and and as, as we go through this process, um, you know, there's going to be a lot of um, discussion in the media. Uh, the media is not a friend to uh, the president-elect. And I think you're going to see them continue to try and divide our country, to try and denigrate what he's doing or trying to do. And to listen to them is going to be listening to the naysayers of, uh, of our society who want to see him fail. Uh, they will want to try and portray him as somebody who is out of touch, doesn't understand the problems of the people, and there couldn't be anything farther from the truth because this is the, 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 the American people stood up in this election and said, you know what, we're tired of being overregulated, we're tired of being overtaxed, we're tired of Washington not listening to us. And the media hadn't got it yet. The media still thinks that they control things, that as long as they can tell you what to do and what to think, that they're going to be able to get away with it. Uh, the president-elect figured out how he can go around them. I'm not a big fan of tweeting, but he likes to tweet, and in doing so, he's used social media to go around the press, and that really torques them. That really aggravates them. And so you're going to see that continue, and I think that uh, that's his way of getting his message out in his way without, being, it, without it being reframed by the media. And I think this, this is going to be a back and forth that you're going to continue to see as we go through this whole process over the next couple of years. Um, and I think just one more point along this, along this line, um, I think that he's a business guy with a very unique situation from the standpoint of being a multi-billionaire. We've never had anybody like this before. Uh, he has investments around the world. And as such, uh, it's very difficult for him to dive, in fact, if it's impossible for him to divest himself of all these investments in a way that makes sense, that may, that in a way that doesn't cost him billions of dollars, in a way that uh, can prevent him from having any sort of uh, conflict of interest. So it's a situation where you're going to continue to see the media go after him every day, regardless of what he does uh, with his presidency, but they're going to go after him every day from the standpoint of this conflict of interest situation because there's no way to get around it. Uh, I think as long as he does what is, in his, what is in the best interest of the country, and if it helps his business, it's fine. If it doesn't help his business, that's fine too. I don't think he's somebody that's going to worry about that one way or the other. When you've got a few billion dollars in your back pocket, who cares whether it's going to make another couple thousand dollars for you or not. But this is going to be a media story every day on, um, on his conflict of interest situation, which is something that, quite frankly, I don't know how you're going to get around it. Um, so they're going to try and, and structure things with his own private uh, uh, investments and businesses in a way that can minimize that, 
but it's, I'm just going to forewarn you, it's going to be a story that comes out every day, and there's nothing you can do about it. So I think uh, as we go through this, uh, the, the media is going to watch him like a hawk on this, and so <laughs> we'll see what happens. But uh, with regards to the priorities of the subcommittee, um, you know, we're going to uh, be just as active next session as we were this session. Uh, we're going to continue to work with all of you. We want to continue to work with the new administration. Uh, we want to use 3700 as the model, try and find new ways to do other things. And um, uh, just as a, just as, a um, as a primer on this, you know, last year my subcommittee held a hearing focused on oversight of rural housing service, of the rural housing service, and Administrator Tony Hernandez was a representative uh, from the, from the and, and, and a representative from GAO testified. The RHS programs were intended to facilitate ownership, develop rental housing, and promote community development through loan and grant programs in rural communities plagued by poverty, substandard homes, housing shortages, costly development, and inadequate access to mortgage loans. I'm concerned that RHS remains plagued by inefficiencies and lacks the technological capacity to effectively carry out its mission. That's not necessarily the fault of RHS, but it's a reality, and this is something that even uh, uh, Administrator Hernandez testified to. He said, we are so far behind with our uh, technology that we have got to get that up to speed as quickly as possible in order for us to be able to deliver services and, and, and track what's going on. Otherwise, we'll continue to fall behind and not be able to do our job. So it's something he's aware of, he's trying to work on. Uh, but again, it's a combination of short funding and a failure on the part of RHS to properly budget for contract renewals. That's kind of caused part of this problem. And uh, we'll see once how they address it. But we're going to work with them and hopefully they will continue to work with us. Um, these are some of the issues I think that, um, you know, Chairman Hensling is gonna to wanna to continue to work on as well. We take a lot of directly from the chairman. He is in charge of the full committee and um, we've, got a lot, we've got a lot on our plate this coming year, but this is something we wanna to continue to work on as best we can. Um, just some quick information. Um, with regards to a recent study by NYU and Capital One, the renter population is growing while affordable housing options, those that consume less than 30% of household income are shrinking. The need to facilitate construction of new housing in rural America should remain a top priority for all of us. In March, my subcommittee held a hearing focused on the relation between regulatory environment and the rising cost of housing. As we learned from that hearing, the American workforce, particularly those living in rural America, is having more and more difficulty finding affordable housing. In that hearing, we focused on the fact that the affordable stock of affordable market rate housing wasn't plentiful enough to support the people seeking it. We, continue to, we need to continue to have an honest conversation about the government's contribution to the price tag of affordable housing, federal, state, and local rules and regulations, including Davis-Bacon wage rates and zoning laws are prov proving to be barriers to the development of affordable uh, housing. In manufactured housing, which provides an important housing option to many families across rural America, rules and regulations from the Department of Housing and Urban Development the Federal Housing Administration, and the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, there's one of my favorite groups, the CFPB, uh, have stifled the availability of an affordable alternative to site-built homes. This is an important conversation to have, one that merits our continued attention and commitment. And I think you can see that uh, that's an issue that's gonna to continue to plague us, it's continues going to dog us, something we have to continue to think about, work on. Um, one of the best ways I believe that we can solve this problem is get the economy going at a faster clip. We're bumping along here at about 1% growth rate, which if you look at the inflation rate, it's 1%, that means you're not growing, you're stagnant. I think if we can get our economy going at 4%, which is very doable, uh, I think you'll see the ability of people to pay for housing go up. I think you'll see the availability of housing go up, and I think those two things can fix some of this problem. Is it gonna go away? No but I think it will help uh, a, a vibrant, growing economy uh, can solve a lot of problems that uh, we're facing right now. And, and, and really, it's, it's, to me, this is the best way to go, go about it. The American people want to work for, for their, what they have. They want to be able to provide for themselves. This is a basic function of who we are as citizens, and uh, the American people believe in this, uh, and I, some people I talk to, they want to try and work for, for a living. They want to be able to provide for themselves. They don't want the government to continue to, to be able to hand them something all the time. They want to be able to work for it. And if we get an economy going that can do that, I think we can, we can really uh, answer a lot of problems and solve a lot of problems. So um, they asked me to take some questions. So that's, uh, the, that's my presentation for today. Thank you for the opportunity to be with you. And I look forward to your questions. Thank you.
trying to organize this. Let's see how it works. Okay. There are pads on your tables. And uh, if you have questions, now the Congressman is a little tight on time. If you don't mind writing your questions and staff will be walking around, uh, picking them up and handing them up here on the stage. Oh, we can just answer from here, let's ask him. Do you want to do that? Same? Sure. Okay. Sure. It'll be faster, Congressman says, if you just get up and ask your questions and he'll recognize you. So. Right here, front row. Thank you very much for being here. Tom yeah. from Kentucky. Uh, just like you heard your take on uh, the budget process for 17, and of course we're going to be rapidly moving into the budget process for 18, how that's all going to work. Or what, what sure. The question is, uh, how's the budget, budget process going to work here? We're going to, as you know, uh, we, our fiscal year is October 1, September 30. We had a uh, continuing resolution to continue the existing budget appropriations bills till uh, December the 8th. Uh, and we will have to pass a short-term CR. I think that's the, the process we're, we're looking at right now to go sometime March 1st of April, somewhere in there, to let the new administration settle in and figure out what they want to do and let them put a stamp on at least the last six months of the budget. Uh, from there, we would probably pass, in, 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 in April, pass the, the balance of, of the, the budget for the rest of the year with whatever changes they want to make. So it gives them some flexibility to go in and either add to or subtract from. Uh, and I think that's where we're headed. Uh, now, with regards to the 18 budget, you know, that, that work starts when we get back in January. Uh, we have, uh, what we do is have a budget and we set the top lines for all of the, the different agencies and then you have what they call appropriations bills which take that top line for ever, let's say you're, you're, we're dealing with the uh, energy department. Uh, you take all of the EPA and all the other energy things in there by program, uh, decide how much money each one's going to get, and that's what the appropriations bills do. And you divide the budget into 12 appropriations bills. And so the budget's usually done by the 1st of April, and then we spend the rest of the, of the uh, four months, uh, April through September, getting the appropriations bills done. And that's actually where you wind up with deciding what programs get hit, what programs get added to, which programs you, you, you do whatever with. So um, this last year, uh, we got most of the appropriations, well, about uh, two-thirds of the appropriations bills done in the House, and then they all died in the Senate. And so that's why we have to do a continuing resolution right now, because we, the, the Senate killed all our appropriations bills. And so we had a, a continuing, the con continuing resolution means that you continue the existing budget with some, whatever changes you may put in the continuing resolution. And so that's what we did. We took the, and actually it was the 2010 budget we're continuing to extend. We haven't had a new budget since 2010. Uh, our appropriations bills, I should say, but the, the budget itself has been, a, it's a 2010 budget that we keep extending. Uh, so we're looking forward to going in and actually getting something done. We go through the appropriations process and do all the changes and make all of the additions and attractions to the budget and then wind up with um, a continuing resolution which basically has minimal changes to what the budget process is. But that's, that's kind of where we are. Um, I don't know what the new administration is going to do with regards to adding to or subtracting from. Uh, I think, uh, if they can grow the economy, we'll have revenues there that can balance the budget at some point. Uh, I'm, I'm very hopeful that can happen. But we've got about a $600 billion deficit right now that's going to have to be worked on. So we'll see once what their priorities are and how they, how they want to approach it. I can tell you the biggest, the, 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 the biggest gorilla in the budget is the Medicare. That if you fix Medicare, you really go a long way towards solving a lot of your budget problems. One of the next, one of the next biggest problems is the interest on the debt, so, which means we've got to stop borrowing money. Because the if you uh, for every one percent increase in, in in interest rate, it costs you about two hundred billion dollars. That blows a hole in your budget just as soon as you get it fixed. So those are just some of the challenges that we've been facing all along, and the new administration is going to face, and we'll see once what their solutions are. Good question. Anybody else? Lady in red back there. Good morning. for USDA rural housing programs. Part of that's because the cost of rental assistance goes up over time. So if rural voters elected Trump, uh, what can we expect from a Republican Congress in terms of m maintaining and protecting those resources for rural voters? Great question. Well, as I, as I mentioned in my discussion, uh, you know, Speaker Ryan, one of the, he's got six different things that we have with our Better Way agenda. A better way agenda is, uh, is what, it's kind of like a contract with America. And one of them in there is poverty and upper mobility. And part of that solution to solving poverty and, and helping people be up more upwardly mobile is to work with the different programs that help and enhance people's ability to get themselves out of this situation. So 
Uh, it can be everything from adding more flexibility to what you all do, to adding more money to this, to uh, uh, I, one, of the, one of the things that they're looking at is trying to enhance people to um, be willing to go to work. Right now you have a situation where if people uh, go to work and they make one dollar more, then it, it kicks them off a lot of the different programs. And so if you, if you phase that out, in other words, if you go to work and you get a raise, you don't lose all your benefits, all your other benefits may, may lose or diminish some of them a little bit, but you don't get kicked off all of them. And so we're kind of looking at trying to phase this out so that as people continue to work, they are not punished for working. Um, a lot of people want to work, but then if you can make more money doing nothing and, and receiving government benefits, why work? And that's a problem that we have. And from the standpoint of employers that I talk to, that's a big problem. Uh, because a lot of people, you know, they will tell you, if you give me a raise, I lose all my benefits. So therefore, if you give me a raise, I'm going to quit. And I've had a number of employers tell me those stories. So those are things that we're going to work on, um, adding ways to help people stay employed, to help people get through these tough times. Uh, so I, I think that we're going to look at everything across the board and how we're going to address that situation. Anybody else? Yes, sir. Will President Trump's emphasis on infrastructure include housing? Uh, I don't think infrastructure is considered, uh, housing is considered part of his infrastructure. I think he's looking more at roads, bridges, uh, railroads, uh, ports, uh, airports, those sort of things. Um, I haven't heard the definition that he's talking about infrastructure being housing. Uh, but I think he is... Um, from, from what I've gathered from some of his transition team discussions, uh, he's going to be looking at this, but it, I don't think it's going to be part of his, his infrastructure program, per se. Anybody else? Yes, ma'am, right here. <clears throat> Good questions this morning. You guys did have two cups of coffee. <laughs> All right. Good morning. Um, some of the HUD block grant programs that serve both urban and rural <coughs> areas have been cut over time. And one of the uh, first new infusions of capital funds um, into housing has been the National Housing Trust Fund. And I'm wondering what your perspective on the future of that uh, funding source is. I would say it probably will not be cut, but I'm not sure it's going to be added to. I, I would think it's probably going to be in the neighborhood of that same figure. Um, if we can give you more flexibility to be able to do more things with it, I think that's where the benefit will come in. Anybody else? That's another question. Yeah, gentleman over here. Hey, good I'm just wondering, from your perspective, do you see an advantage to maintaining the rural housing service as a separate agency in terms of its capacity to serve rural areas? Can I ask you a question? Pardon? What's your, what's your opinion of that? I think it, it's a tremendous advantage, yes, because it's, it's serving local communities. It's got capacities that HUD does not have, and therefore I would you know, maintain it. So your, your question is, do I think that we need to combine it, and you believe we shouldn't? Is that what you're saying? Okay, if you want to rephrase it that way, Well, sure. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to make sure. I, I don't want to put words in your mouth, sir, but I, I'm trying to make sure I, I understand your perspective, too. Because that, this is a very difficult question, because... Right now, the Real Housing Service, as, the, as Administrator Hernandez has indicated in his testimony in our com in committee, is not working very well. I'm sure all of you would agree that there are a lot of things that can be done better. He, uh, technology is, and his ability to manage his agency is very, very difficult right now. And so how do you solve that problem? Do you spend millions and millions more dollars to try and improve the technology when you have another agency that basically does the same thing, only its emphasis is not necessarily rural, but, but across the board? Uh, so that will be a decision. I, I can't tell you which way it's going to go, but I, I think that there is a lot of discussion about combining them. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Very good. That it? Yeah. Answered everybody? Yeah. Oh, one, one more. more. Okay. <clears throat> I didn't answer your question last. Oh, this is a different lady. I'm sorry. Yeah, good morning. Um, one of the byproducts of the election has been a fallout in equity markets over speculation of corporate tax reform. Can you talk a little bit about your opinion on the low-income housing tax credit program and what the future of that program is? Oh, great question. Well, so far the markets have reacted very positively to, to, the, uh, to the election. Um, 
I don't really know what the position is of the new administration on that. We haven't talked to them about that at all. They haven't. Um, I think that whatever, in, I, ha I have to believe though that the, the incentives that are in place, things that actually work are things are gonna keep. The things that don't work are probably gonna get moved on. Uh, this is a program that is, is generally works pretty well. Uh, so I would think it would be looked at pretty favorably. Um, to me, uh, a tax credit program is something, normally it's an incentive for people to do, the, do what you want them to do. And if you can partner with the private sector on something like that, I think it's, uh, it's a great way to go. But I, quite frankly, I don't know where the new administration is on that because we have not had that discussion. But that's a great question. Thank you for the question. Anybody? Yes, ma'am. To work out in the field. These guys in, in this area here, they had three cups of coffee, I can tell. <laughs> yeah, I work, out, I work out in the field for rural development. I'm not understanding how you are saying that we're not performing. You, the 30% of our employees have been cut, and yet we still manage to fund the total amount of what we are allotted. We're taking care of our properties, our multifamily housing properties. We, we're working hard, and to say that we're not performing, I don't understand how that can be said. Well, I didn't say you weren't performing. I mean, what I'm saying is that there are some problems within the agency that need, that need fixing. That's where the problem's at. You guys are doing a good job of administering the programs, but the agency's got a problem standpoint of how I they're, think, I think how they're I, operating. I think the, what you were talking about is, is uh, Tony Hernandez was wanting a software program that would help with the guaranteed loans. I well, think, it is across the board problem with this technology problem. Well, I know that we're working hard and we're taking very good care of the taxpayers' dollars. We're taking okay. very good care of the taxpayers. And we're very successful. Okay. Very good. Great point. Thank you for the comment. Yes, anybody else? Way in the back. Shout it out. Um, there's a lot of us in the room that, that uh, utilize these programs, and I th would appreciate it if you could uh, consider having a dialogue with us um, to talk about the advantages of keeping the two agencies separate. Sure. Yeah, we're going to, uh, when, you know, beginning next year, is, you know, I, I serve as a committee chair at the pleasure of the, uh, the, uh, the chairman. So if, I'm continue, if I continue to be the chairman, we'll have another discussion because I know there's a lot of issues we want to bring to the table again like 3,700 that we want to talk about, and I can guarantee you we want to include you in the discussion to make sure that we get everybody's view, and what are the things we can do to make this a better program and better agency and all that sort of stuff. So yeah, no, it's, if I'm there next, this next year, we will continue to have a dialogue. Uh, to me, the way you solve problems is get everybody around a table, and you know what the problems are, you know what the solutions are, I don't. I'm, I'm not in your shoes every day, and that's why we need to talk to you, that's why we have hearings, that's why we have round tables. And those of you who are familiar with the 3700 process, that's what we did. We have multiple hearings and multiple roundtables and personal discussions and meetings I like to wore ourselves out. But at the end of the day, we came up with a good bill that I think addressed a lot of things that were discussed that everybody could agree to. And that's what we want to do again. So yeah, absolutely. We will be in, involved in discussions. And thank you for, and hope that you'll be part of the, uh, participating in that discussion as well. Absolutely. Anybody else? They got them all? Okay, very good. Well, thank you again for the opportunity to be with you. And uh, while you're here, enjoy the town and enjoy the city. The weather's not going to be too good today, but it looks like tomorrow's going to be better. So my, agent, my uh, department and uh, an office can help you out at any uh, point during uh, your stay here. Don't hesitate to give us a call. Thank you.